Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank the association, Bill and Leslie. Thanks for having me here. I'm looking forward to talking to you all. And it's a real privilege for me to go around the country talking to trustees, to physicians, to administrators about these issues, because I keep a really positive image. And as you heard earlier in Rita's talks, there are some changes we need to do, and a lot of them not so fun. But I think we're going to get there, and I'm excited about it. We're going to talk today about something that I think is a little bit different, but something that's going to hit us all, and that's how this little phone is going to change some of the very things we do in medicine and do in a very profound way, and I, I believe arguably in a very good way for the patients. So just when Rita was talking about how the PC changed the whole world for IBM, in a way, this is kind of changing the world for healthcare. I'm going to talk about six things that are all leading to an accelerated process to our doing this, and actually going to surmise by saying this is going to improve our medical care, and for you, the patient, it's going to be a really good thing that's happened. I'm going to say some of the stuff that actually Rita was talking about earlier this morning in a different kind of light, though, because I think there's a lot of ways you can look at some of this stuff. I want to talk, as she did, about a little bit of transparency and how it is a great accelerator in this entire process. Transparency is one of the best things that's happened to medicine, and I'll get into that in a second. How information technology is revolutionizing how we get information, how we process it, and how we communicate it to our patients. This leads right into another phenomenon, the whole idea of the empowered patient the patient making a bigger role in what's going on. It's now called things like shared decision making, all these kind of things that we're dealing with. How genomics is changing a fundamental approach to how we're practicing medicine. How these apps that are now available to any consumer is going to change what we're going to do. And then finally, what does that mean to something that's always been really important to me my whole career, and that is the doctor-patient relationship. Judy Hibbard, years ago at the University of Washington, she's done a lot of work in health affairs. You've probably read a lot of her articles. Good, good person. She said, that which is measured tends to improve. That which is measured publicly tends to improve faster. She said what we concluded, that even when hospitals knew their performance wasn't good, that wasn't enough motivation making a public change. And I don't want to be disingenuous, but to the CEOs in the room, you did not want to hear in the press or in the newspapers that the competitors got a better score than you are. And it's what's motivated us, maybe kind of a little bit for the wrong reason, but who cares? And you know what? The cool thing is, I can say categorically, going around the country, your hospital is safer today than it's ever been, right? You know what the even cooler news is? Next year, you're going to be even safer. And that's what's really been good about this whole transparency thing. I'll go so far as to say to you that transparency is the best thing that's happened to quality since antibiotics. I mean, it really is. You look at the data, and that's what it shows. These big rises that we had in terms of improving our surgical infections, all these kind of things, happened after transparency, not before. When I'm asked around the country, what is the biggest game changer in healthcare this year? The biggest game changer. It's not ACOs, it's not ACA, it's not Obamacare, it's high deductibles. And what's going on, very simply, is as healthcare costs go up and up and up faster than employers and others can compensate, they cost shift down to the consumer, either in terms of a higher deductible, higher copay. Bottom line is patient pays more out of pocket. And if I'm paying out of pocket, I am interested in the price. Back in the days when I had a $50 copay and went to the ER and here's my 50 bucks, you can order whatever test you want. You know, about a year ago I was in my boat and I was pulling the battery out and I slid open my finger. And I could see it was bleeding, it needed stitches, and I could see the flexor tendons and everything was okay, but I knew it had to be sewed. I also knew I was on staff at that hospital. I make one call on the boat. They'll have everything ready. I'll be in and out of there in 10 minutes, or I'll just sew it myself. But I'll be like right out of there. So I didn't even care about that. I did know, because I did a cost analysis earlier, that it was going to cost me 1700 bucks, And I hadn't used my deductible yet. So I'm sitting on the boat with a bleeding, dripping finger going 1700 bucks, and was within arm's reach of me was a roll of duct tape. I made a decision. And you know, my face, that's okay, it works. <laughs> it was my kid's face, maybe, but no, no. I made a decision as a consumer. I wasn't going to pay 1700 bucks to have my finger sewed up. Right, wrong, otherwise, this is now in the realm of the consumer. The average single premium has increased 400%. 400% and going higher. In fact, there's going to be now a greater demand for this price transparency than ever before. 
When I was chairman of the board of the Texas Institute of Healthcare Quality, I invited the medical director of United Healthcare, and you heard Rita refer to United in Minneapolis. He brought in his phone. He said, let me show you something. We've got an app. We've got an app that you can get on. And he hooked his phone up to the screen so you know, we could see it as he's doing this stuff. He put in his name, or logged in. He said, this app is specific to my plan, the status of my deductible today, I mean, everything, everything. He said, OK, let's say now I need my hip replaced and I need an MRI. So he typed in MRI. And it showed about 20 places in Minneapolis where United, well, you know, he's under contract to get an MRI. And it showed him what he would have to write a check for at the end of that thing. Now, again, it varied on everybody. It varied on what your plan is, what you're doing, but, but it was specific for him. And you know what? The prices ranged from $600 to $1,800. And then all he had to do was click this thing, and then they'd set up an appointment. That is what we need to do in price transparency. Now, the good news from the standpoint of the hospitals is, yeah, it is a health plan issue because you don't know what someone's going to pay for a procedure. It could be any one of a thousand things. It depends where I am at any point in time with my plans, et cetera. They've figured it out. And by the way, then they could choose orthopedic surgeons. And he hit orthopedic surgeons. And it showed, I don't know, 50 orthopedic surgeons in Minneapolis. And they were rated on their average cost and their average quality. By the way, one of the things the medical director said that was very smart is you don't want to look at cost unless you look at quality. You know, does a Mercedes cost more than a Yugo? Yeah. But is there a reason for it, et cetera? Oh, and by the way, do you want to go to the cheapest surgeon in town? I think not. But here's the point. The point is now this phone. I've just been told by my doctor I need an MRI. I can get on this thing. Nowhere to go. Oh, by the way, it had wait times on there too, average wait times. And I know what I'd have to pay. And I made a choice. And if I want to go to that $1,800 hospital, because I like the piano in the atrium or something, I can go. But I now have to write a check. This is where this price transparency, two issues here, because I know it's always unpopular to talk about. It's really the health plans and those folks' ability to do it. I don't like to see this burden on either the hospitals or the physicians. But people are going to want to know. I personally have a $5,000 deductible. And it's February, and I haven't used it yet. And if I have a choice between a $600 MRI and an $1,800 MRI, and this telephone can tell me that, that's where I'm going to go. Anybody know what a zettabyte is? I didn't, but it's a 1 followed by 21 zeros. Our kids are going to know what a zettabyte is, because 20 years from now, 10 years from now on the phone, that's the amount of memory you're going to have is this zettabyte. We really need to understand where this thing is going. Again, a whole talk I want to just synopsize into just a few minutes here. This whole idea of the ICD-10, the EMRs, everybody hates it. Everywhere I go, docs hate the EMRs, and I understand why. National studies show that when you institute an EMR, the average productivity of the physicians drops 15%. How are we mostly paid, despite what Rita says? Right now, mostly in productivity. So you're going to tell me, hey, we got this new thing I got to do. You got to make me type which I, you know, I didn't go to four years of medical school to type. And my productivity is going to go down 15%. What I tell CEOs when they're instituting an EMR is the old Woody Allen line when he said, I'm not afraid of dying. I just don't want to be there when it's happening. Take a sabbatical, man. It's not going to be fun. But it's an opportunity. The ability to take ICD-9s with its additional codes, the ability to have standard medical records, which now gives us databases of the hundreds of millions, ultimately, is going to change how we do clinical research and how clinical medicine is going to go. The combination of these two is going to lead us to a quantum leap in new information. I believe the EMR will do for healthcare what the assembly line did for manufacturing. That's how profound this is all going to be when we get our act together. We're not there yet, but when we do. Combine it to this whole thing with the cloud and the EMRs, we're going to see databases that presently, when we look at databases that we have, they're what I call descriptive, meaning they just tell you yesterday's weather. You know, it's a bunch of old claims data that told you what used to happen. It's like trying to manage your baseball team based on last year's stats or something. It's limited. But as we start getting this information, we're going to go to the second generation of predictive, where this database can say, now that we're following hundreds of millions of people, we can now tell you what's going to happen with high probability to you tomorrow. And we can make it then more prescriptive. So therefore, here's what we need to do. 
I am very excited what I, what I see in the high tech stuff. I'm speaking in two weeks in Las Vegas at a uh, talk on, it's all on innovation and all on new technology. And this stuff blows you away that's just around the corner and is going to start happening. We're going to see our guidelines now because of these things do better. We're going to see the ability to do it, and it's now going to come on to here. You know, when I look at information, back in medical school once, we were all doing rounds, and the medical students were circled around the patient's bed, and the attending was being a jerk, and he said, okay, what are the 16 causes of pancreatitis? Well, you know, so we were around the circle. And the first two we knew, kind of easy, and then like it gets harder and harder and harder, and you felt like a real dummy if you didn't know all 16 causes of pancreatitis. Now, unfortunately, I have this phone off right now because it interferes with the mic. But what I would do is I could get on here to Siri. Siri, what are the causes of pancreatitis? Within a second or two, I have a list. Think of how that changes medical knowledge. Do I have to know the 16 causes of pancreatitis? Or do I have to have the judgment, clinical judgment, to make that diagnosis? And Siri can tell me the 16 things. Very interesting. Because what's now happening to physicians is do I need to know all that or do I need to have access to it? And what it's doing is changing medical education to teach us better clinical judgment and less of a rel reliance on, oh gosh, I had to memorize all the muscles. They're like 200 muscles and how they were innervated and all the rest of that. I can get this like this anytime I need it. So it's really interesting. The data is significant whether it's significant or not. If patients look up your HCAP scores or look up your core measures and you're a 3 plus and the other guy's a 5 plus, and by the way, who's doing it? Studies have shown this. Number one, they have a computer. Number two, they have a job. They are much more likely to be the folks we very much want to put in our hospitals. So the very folks that can walk or could fly to Mayo, the ones we want to keep, are the ones doing this. So we could talk on and on about this kind of stuff. It's a real big issue. The role of genomics, and this is fascinating to me because we never had this stuff when I was in medical school. By simply looking at your genes, by taking a buccal smear, a smear of your cheek, a newborn baby's blood, any of the above, we can find a lot of basic things, like, for example, if they're carriers for certain diseases, like cystic fibrosis. We can also tell by simply looking at your DNA, your relative risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, cancers, etc. And by the way, we could do this in an infant and know their lifetime risk. We can also see how their liver system works in terms of metabolizing drugs. One of the major reasons for adverse drug effects across the country is that we all metabolize drugs differently. So we're all cloned, Lasix, 40 milligrams. Well, 40 milligrams may mean one thing to your body and something else to someone else's body. So bottom line, it's now available. How is this going to change stuff? And what it's doing is it's going to change our model. Our traditional model, patient develops symptoms, goes to the healthcare system, we do a history, physical exam, make a diagnosis, and then do a treatment. The new model, testing can be done up front. Testing can be done remotely. We know your lifetime risk of a certain disease and can preemptively do it. If you're at twice the risk of heart disease at age 20, hey, if we help you reduce your weight, lower your cholesterol, do that stuff, we may actually be able to prevent it. And if you're at half the risk of some disease, well, let's focus on the others. So this is going to speed us doing an individual diagnosis. So this whole immediacy thing has really led to thousands of apps available. And I'm just going to briefly show you some. We have one app you can buy that you do the blood work, and you stick it on the app. It sends the blood work to the emergency room or to your doctor's office, and they can respond right then. So if you're, not a, if you're a diabetic and you're not feeling well, you buy this little app, you prick your finger, put it into that thing, plugs into your phone, goes into your doctor's office. You can do the same thing with EKGs. There is a microphone app that you can buy for less than $5 that you can, a layperson can just stick on their chest and it is like a big microphone. And it then transmits your heart sounds or your lung sounds or bowel sounds or whatever right to the doctor's office. So you could say, hey, I'm feeling some you know, heart palpitations and I can actually listen to your heart remotely. One of my favorite is this thing on the ear exams. I mean, how many of you as a parent have had your kid at 10 o'clock at night tugging on their ear you know darn well they got an ear infection and you're going to your husband or wife going, oh man, okay, who's going to stay up with her? Who's going to take off work tomorrow to go visit the ER? And all she needs is some darn amoxicillin anyway, right? And by the way, this is her fourth ear infection. I kind of get it. 
there's this app for less than 50 bucks. It's a little camera. And you insert the camera into the kid's ear. Takes a picture of the tympanic membrane, shoots it to the emergency room. So now I'm sitting in the emergency room. I see a tympanic membrane this big on my screen. Go, hey, guess what? Ear infection. Here's a prescription. Go get it filled. These are available. And as a mom or dad, wouldn't, how much would you pay for that? I mean, you can get amoxicillin in that kid's body within an hour at 10 o'clock at night. That's pretty darn cool. We've got ones that do eye exams that can actually do refractions over the phone. You stick the thing up to your eye, and it does all the goofy things to measure it. And you, that gets sent into the you know, lens place, and an hour later, you get your glasses. One thing after another. Again, I spent a whole talk on this, all available here. And these apps are going up you know, exponentially. We can be monitored. There's an app in Houston that I've used a lot that just shows all the ERs in town and their average wait time. So now you're at the baseball game, and your kid looks like a broken arm. And you can quickly look and see what's the nearest hospital and what's the wait time and go right there. You can connect Holter monitors onto the phone. So we could follow people with heart disease, follow people with chest pain, all of the above. There's actually one that came out last week for $15. You can buy a little lens that fits onto your phone lens that serves as a microscope. If you have a lesion on your skin, you can hold that thing up, take a picture, send it to the dermatologist, and they see it this big. So how is that changing what we're doing? And we could see substantially. The old model was the patient goes to the doctor, takes some results, takes time, and the patient scheduled a follow-up. The new model, doctor comes to the patient, electronically or otherwise. Technology is on site, results immediately available. So some of this technology on site is pretty amazing, because we can do it. There are machines that get this thing done. Uh, we can look at all this kind of stuff faster, faster, and faster. Which leads me to telemedicine. Again, another hour topic, but a two-minute summary. We're seeing it. It's everywhere. It's doing great things. To me, there are some things we need to look at. And again, I'm going to go very fast, but there are four challenges currently in telemedicine. We're going to figure out. The first is the quality. Yeah, we do have to ensure that that person on the end of the line is a physician or a quality person, et cetera. We have to deal with licensing. Because in states, we're licensed as docs to practice in one state or another. Telemedicine knows no state boundaries. So we have to figure that one out. And by the way, the various medical boards don't want to lose revenue of making each physician register in each state. And it's about $1,000 a year per state and all that kind of deal. We also have to figure out how to compensate. We need to do it. Hey, lawyers have figured it out. You know, you don't have to visit a lawyer in person. You call them up and guess what? You know, that phone's ticking. I get it. And you get a bill. We need to have a similar mechanism in medicine. And we're getting there. A lot of them. And then the final piece is there needs to be some degree of indemnification, acknowledging the fact that a telemedicine visit is not quite as good as someone I can see and touch and feel and all that kind of thing. That's getting better and better. But those are our challenges. We're going to get there. What's even more exciting to me about telemedicine is not the prospect of getting some specialist into rural North Carolina that no one could ever see previously or something. Case in point, you have an appointment at 2 o'clock this afternoon with your local doc for follow-up. 2 o'clock. So you've got to leave your office at what? Well, at least 1 o'clock because you've got to be there, you've got to drive there, you've got to sit in the office, maybe get sick in the office from all the other folks. Doctor's running late, you're ticked off. The average door-to-door -door time for a routine follow-up visit is three and a half hours. All right, so now you're going, guess what? For that 2 o'clock appointment, I'm going to be out of my office for three and a half hours. Or what if I'm a worker uh, on time or union time or I have to take an occurrence or I got a kid and I got to worry about the rest? What if I said to you at 2 o'clock I'm going to Skype you and we can talk, we can talk, and you know, your foot hurts, show me your foot, you know, those kind of things. Would you do it? And we go, heck yes. And by the way, would you pay me my full office visit? You're going to go, of course I would, man, because I got to see you anyway. It's going to be the same result and I can be in my office all day getting my work done. That's where I see telemedicine really making the changes. And that's where I see where I can get my doc right on Skype. Now, a study showed that 30 to 40% of all medical follow-up visits can be done by Skype. Now, I don't want to be like ruling out concussion or something over Skype or rule out a heart attack, but be reasonable. But for routine follow-ups and for things like that. So how do we adjust? How do we redefine that H? 30 to 40% of our ambulatory visits can be done this way. We need to develop a way, and systems are doing it, 
of acknowledging that. I, as an internist, 30 to 40 percent of my visits can now be done this way. I want to embrace it. Robotics. Many of you are dealing with the da Vinci's and all the rest. If a surgeon can be in the adjacent room doing that, why can't they be 100 miles away and do it? And granted, there are things we have to find. You know, complications occasionally occur, but mostly it's a bleeding that can usually be taken care of, and there's ways of doing it. But those are things to think about. And then finally, how's that going to change our doctor-patient relationship? You know, are we going to get to the point where who needs a doctor? I got Siri. No, I don't think we're going to be there, and I sure, as, sure hope not. But just as I talked about that old model, the old model with the physician in control, face-to-face -face visits, and the caregiver needing to know all the information, it's now shifting to a joint responsibility. Patient empowerment, shared decision making, remote access for both. There are certain things I need to do on site with you as my patient, but there are many things I don't. And we're all busy people and we all want things immediately. So, you know, are we going to go the route of the personal banker? Where How many of you have been, been in a bank recently? You know, it's been years for many people. You just go to the ATM. Back when I was a kid, every week I saved my little pennies and my mom brought me to the bank and I gave it to the teller and all that kind of stuff. And many of us haven't been there. Well, no, it's not going to get there. Because there will always be a key role for us as caregivers to take a personal response. I don't want it to be so impersonal that it could be Siri. I value that relationship. But I now as a physician have to acknowledge, and you as hospitals have to acknowledge, 30 to 40 percent of our business is going to shift in this area. And maybe more, actually, as we get into real-time stuff, and, and who knows, are we going to be able to accommodate that? And the whole model of the doctor-patient relationship is no longer the doctor giving orders and the patient doing them. It's now a community effort between the physicians, our extenders, the patients, the family, and what we can get off of our various devices.